Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Bipartisan Policy Center for today's fireside chat with Utah Governor Spencer J. Cox. I'm Dennis Shea, the Executive Director of the J. Ronald Terwilliger Center. Launched last September, the Terwilliger Center was founded to advance the goal of realizing a decent, safe, and affordable home for every American family. We are thrilled to have Governor Cox with us today. A sixth generation Utah and a graduate of Utah State University, Governor Cox has devoted decades of his life to public service. A former city councilman, mayor, county commissioner, and member of Utah's House of Representatives, he was appointed to serve as state's lieutenant governor in 2013 before his election in 2020 as Utah's 18th governor. Since his inauguration, Utah has continued to boast the strongest state economy in the nation based on its business environment, high rate of employment, and high rate of growth. And yet Utah, like most states in the nation, continues to face a worrying lack of affordable and available homes, both for rent and for sale. In 2019, 35% of Utah's 76,000 renters were burdened by housing costs, spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. And prospective buyers, meanwhile, face fast rising home prices amid a nationwide inventory shortage. In the last year alone, Utah's home value index rose by nearly 30%. To his great credit, Governor Cox has elevated the issue of housing affordability as a top priority for his administration. And we look forward to hearing his vision for the state in just a few moments. But before we do, I wanna offer a quick reminder to our virtual audience that they can submit questions for Governor Cox by tweeting them to at BPC underscore bipartisan throughout the webinar using the hashtag BPC Live. You're also welcome to submit your questions in the YouTube chat. With that, I wanna offer a very warm welcome to Governor Cox. Governor Cox, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Dennis, it's great to be with you. Well, as I, as I alluded to in my opening, you know, Utah has been a victim of its own success. I mean, it's a growing, prosperous, and desirable place to live. So it's not surprising uh, that your state has seen some of the fastest rising house prices and rents in the country. So how concerned are you about housing affordability? And what are you hearing from your constituents on this issue? Yeah, Dennis, well, again, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this discussion on what I believe is, is one of the most important topics. I'm, I'm often troubled by how much time we spend debating the divisive culture war issues and uh, that, that don't affect very many people, honestly. So it's refreshing to talk about something that is actually very relevant to, uh, to people's lives. And, uh, and you framed it correctly, uh, especially as, as far as Utah is concerned. Uh, we were abs absolutely victims uh, of our own success. And the housing problem in Utah is, is worse than uh, most of us realized or expected. We, we really pride ourselves on the strength and, and diversified nature of our overall economy. We have the, the lowest unemployment in the nation right now, 1.9%. That's the lowest in our state's history. We have uh, low taxes, a, a really business-friendly environment, and, uh, and, and, and so much more. <clears throat> but unfortunately, housing is now, I believe, uh, one of our, our biggest challenges. Housing prices, as you mentioned, grew 27% in 2021 over, over the year before. And for renters, those monthly prices increased about 21%. There's some interesting survey data that we've seen here in Utah as well around the term growth. Uh, if you go back just a few years, you know, five, six, seven years ago, the, the term growth had a very positive connotation in Utah. We were the fastest growing state in the nation uh, during the, the last census over the last 10 years. People associated that term with higher rate wages and more job opportunities and a higher standard of living, all, all of those things. But that perception has unfortunately dropped precipitously since then. Uh, 
And now the term growth uh, has, a, has a negative connotation. People think about traffic, expensive homes, a lower standard of living. So uh, as, as you said, Utah is currently now one of the top 10 worst housing markets in terms of affordability when you look at the uh, at, at income relative to, uh, to housing costs. And uh, people are also surprised to learn that we're a very densely populated uh, uh, state. We, we are a big rural state, uh, obviously, but most of our population is concentrated, about 85% of our population is clustered along what we call the Wasatch Front, this narrow piece of our state between Ogden in the north and, and Provo in the south with, uh, with Salt Lake City in the, uh, in, in the middle of that, uh, of, of that, that cluster. And uh, it actually, we, we are considered the eighth most densely populated uh, state in the country because of, of that clustering. Uh, I mentioned oh, being the fastest thing. growing state. Um, so so we, we, you usually think about LA and San Francisco, New York, you know, Chicago, places like that. But Utah is right up there with these housing challenges that we're facing now. Big concern for me and, and for everybody in the state. Well, well, thank you for that, Governor. I mean, you've proposed in your budget, as I understand, more spending uh, to address homelessness and to build more affordable housing. So could you just walk us through your priorities and, and the legislative path forward? Sure. I think it's important to, that, that we, we, we talk about those different dichotomies. So deeply affordable housing, um, making sure that we're working to prevent homelessness is, is absolutely critical. As, as prices go up, we need to keep people in their homes. Uh, we, we found it's, it's much uh, less expensive, much less of a burden on taxpayers if we're able to keep people from becoming homeless in, in, the, in the very first place. So uh, the, the legislature has stepped up. We didn't get quite as much money as we were hoping for, but uh, about $55 million in deeply affordable housing this year, which is far more than we've ever gotten before. So we're excited. That's just coming into our budget starting on July 1. And uh, we'll be working with municipalities who also got some ARPA funds and, and other monies that, that are available to partner with us in that deeply affording, affordable housing category. Uh, but we're, we're working on more than that. We're working for workforce housing in, in many places in rural Utah. Over the past three legislative sessions, the legislature has supported uh, the Utah Housing Preservation Fund with nearly $50 million, which has led to over $120 million of private funding with the goal of preserving affordable housing. So, so these different ideas are, are all part of a solution that, that we're working on to preserve our existing stock of affordable housing, build new affordable housing, and uh, make sure that, uh, that, that we're working on, on housing stock, for, not just in the deeply affordable area, but for, for everyone, new, new, uh, new couples that are, are trying to buy their first home, we're, we're really working across the board and trying to partner again with the private sector, the nonprofit sector, so we can make those dollars go further. Well, you've raised some really interesting points. I mean, people often, when they talk about affordable housing, they forget about the real critical need to preserve what we already have and, and to keep it uh, affordable. And you, you, you also mentioned the kind of all hands on deck approach. It's the government can't do it alone. We need to be working closely with the private sector and, and philanthropy, the nonprofit sector. But let's just talk about supply a little bit more. I mean, the Twilliger Center, we've been really um, highlighting this issue. We Nationwide, there's a supply shortage of millions of homes. The estimates vary. Uh, one estimate says 5.5 million. Uh, we've underbuilt homes by 5.5 million over the past 20 years. But Utah, you, you are building housing, uh, to, to your credit. In fact, in 2021, Utah permitted 75% uh, more housing units than the state did just five years earlier. So what, what has led to that success? And are there any particular challenges or headwinds uh, standing in the way of this trend continuing? Sure. So we have a commission on housing affordability, which I chair, and uh, we've worked to build better collaboration between developers and local municipalities. Um, it's, it's no secret. I know you, you've talked about it many times. The nimbyism that, that exists across the country um, exists here in, in Utah as well. And we, we have um, some difficult incentive structures. I'm, I'm, I'm a local government guy. As, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a former city councilman and a former mayor, and, and I understand those challenges. We, we often 
didn't have people coming to us, uh, members of city councils and mayors saying, I know we need to approve this project. I know it's really important, uh, but uh, but I also know if I do, I probably won't get reelected. And there, there's, a, there's a very big group of vocal critics, even if they're small in, you know, in municipal elections, they can have an, an outsized influence. So we're, we're constantly battling that. I, I should mention that in Utah, our shortage is about 40,000 homes. Uh, so for a state with a population of 3.4 million people, that's a significant shortage. And uh, it, it's we're, we're also growing. So it's not just 40,000 every day as more and more people are moving here. That's that's the the the, the, the constant growth factor that we're we're struggling with. Uh, and, and, and so we've been working very closely with uh, with our, our municipalities, uh, with our legislature to uh, to try to find ways to help our municipalities to to allow for more housing. This is this is. Uh, and you, you said it in the question. I mean, this is economics 101. It really right. is about supply. There, there is no other there's no other way to make this happen other than we need more housing. We need more density and density. <clears throat> Density is neither good nor bad. Sometimes uh, when, when we talk about density, there's this immediate kind of negative connotation. But, but, but I, I say often, and people get tired of me saying it, that the density is only bad if you don't have infrastructure. If, if, you know, if, if, you, if density comes before infrastructure, the quality of life goes down. But if, if, if uh, infrastructure comes first and then density follows, the quality of life can stay high. So we've really been focused on improving uh, the, the infrastructure piece of this. The last two sessions um, we've uh, we have uh, approved our, our budgets uh, more infrastructure spending than ever before in our state's history and uh, and then making sure that our municipalities allow for density where we are putting that infrastructure so uh, around transit uh, for for example where the state is investing in transit um, high-speed rail and uh, and and light rail uh, that, uh, that 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 cities have to allow density around those areas. So, so we, we, we have had the state taking a, a little bigger role, still mostly local control, but with, with some of those exceptions that I think are important. Um, one of the other things we did was we, we passed a statewide law that required, uh, required municipalities to allow for, uh, for uh, accessory dwellings um, like uh, basement apartments and, and mother-in-law apartments. Uh, we had several municipalities that had outlawed those. Now, we, we haven't taken all the control away. They still control things like, uh, like parking and, and, uh, and other issues around those, uh, those accessory dwellings, but they have to allow those now. So, so those are some of the steps that we've been able to take as a state to, to really help our municipalities allow for more building and more density. The, the last thing I'll mention, and this is one where I, I haven't quite figured this out, um, but we're doing something now um, in, in our country uh, that we've never done before. And that is that we're taking houses and turning them into hotels. Um, the, the short term rental piece of this with VRBOs and, and Airbnbs, um, this, this is a new phenomenon. And you, what we're seeing in Utah, as I've looked at the numbers, we're building more and more homes, again, at, at an expedited rate more than ever before in our state's history. Um, but we, we aren't seeing the, the, what we would expect to see is a measured decline in, in housing prices, uh, because that, that, that amount of housing should be keeping up with the new growth, at least that is coming in and should stabilize things. But we, we estimate we have about 20,000 homes that are now short-term rentals in, in the state, which is something we haven't had before. And so that's, that's housing stock that now isn't being rented to families or available for purchase by, by first-time homeowners or, or others. And uh, that's not something that we've kind of figured out yet how to get our arms around that. I'm a, I'm a private property rights person. And so I, I, I don't like to tell people they can't do those, those types of, of things with their property, but it is an issue. And I think it's an issue we need to talk Talk about more. So, so these temporary these temporary rentals are really going to tourists or temporary residents of the state, and the, the effect of that you want them in your state, you want them spending money in in the state, enjoying Utah, but they're also uh, taking housing stock away from the 
from the full-time residents. Is that, is that exactly? And and the tourism piece is a big piece of this. And right. again, Utah is a tourist state, um, and, and right. we're very right. proud of that. It's one one of the biggest drivers of our economy, but especially around our, for example, our national parks. I'll give you an example: some really small towns around uh, around our national parks, where um, traditionally the housing has been very affordable. These are these are tiny rural towns, um, but now as as more and more homes are being turned into short-term rentals, we have school teachers that can't live within 100 miles of the of the the school that they teach at because they they there are no homes in there are just no homes for sale in those areas and when a new home is built it's immediately turned into a short-term rental and uh you know people can make more money doing that as as tourists come in um or or people from california are buying second homes or third homes uh here in utah to come and vacation in sometimes they're used as rentals sometimes they, ju they just stay vacant but uh but that's that's really chewing up how housing stock in areas where we desperately need it. Yeah, so that's a major challenge for you going forward. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, previously a couple of important issues like building affordable housing near, near transit uh, hubs to ensure that uh, the people who live there have access to, can get to jobs and, and, and other opportunities and uh, accessory dwelling units. Uh, I know a lot of communities throughout the United States are looking at ADUs, incentivizing uh, the preservation of uh, housing that can be converted to an ADU or, or building new ADUs. And some people I understand are finding it helpful to pay for their mortgage as, as, uh, uh, as housing costs. So I just, just quick, quickly, what kind of reaction are you getting from your constituents and the local leaders with your push for transit oriented development and alternative forms of housing like, like ADUs? Yeah, What's the reaction? It, it's it's mostly positive, I, I would say. Obviously, there's some pushback, and and, and we'll always have pushback any time that uh, that that kind of what has traditionally been local municipality controlled power gets you usurped by the state um, for maybe maybe lack of a better term. And so finding that balance, I think, is important. And uh, and I think we've done a better job of that. Again, I, I will I will have local authorities say, hey, I can't say this, I can't say this publicly, but we need this. To Development. We need a place for our, our kids and grandkids to live. And, uh, you know, even though I kind of have to publicly say I, I wish the state wouldn't do this, uh, I think it's a, I'm, I'm really glad the state is, is doing this in those areas. And again, I think there's, it makes sense to me because there is a state nexus. We are investing um, big dollars, state dollars, taxpayer dollars in these, these transit hubs. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in turn, then, I, I think the state government has a, has a duty uh, to, to make sure that the, the zoning is such that there is the, the potential for, for more density around these transit hubs. So it hasn't been too controversial. There has been a little pushback, but we're able to work through those things. And we work with our League of Cities and Towns, which is the, the, the association that represents those municipalities to, uh, to find that balance and, and try to get it right. Now, many of these changes that I mentioned just happened in this past legislative session. So they're just going into effect. So over the next year or two, we'll be able to measure the effectiveness of, uh, of those new policy proposals. But, uh, but, I, but I am very excited about, uh, about some of the changes that we have been able to make. Are you, are you uh, let me just follow up on that. Are you, do you have pro data, data analysis programs in place? You, I mean, that's really intriguing that you mentioned that you're gonna study the, the effect of the policies uh, very, very often policymakers don't do that they they implement the policy without actually examining the effects so is there a data component of your housing housing work yeah, there, there is. And, and this is really important to me. We've worked really hard as an administration. I've, I've only been in office now for a, a year and a half almost, I guess. Uh, but uh, but to make sure that we are data driven in our in our policy making and uh, that we are tracking everything that we do, the decisions that we make, um, we're creating dashboards to uh, so, so that we can follow in as close to real time as possible what is happening with those decisions. So we'll be looking at the, the number of units that are created in these in these areas. We'll be looking at the overall price, of course, of, of, uh, of housing units in, in these areas and uh, just, just trying to figure out what's working and what isn't working to make sure that the, that the next decisions are even better and, and more fine-tuned going forward. Right. Well, Governor, you are living proof that so much of housing policy is driven by state and uh, local uh, officials like yourself. Uh, but the federal government, of course, uh, provides uh, significant resources through programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, 
uh, HUD's Housing Choice Voucher Program, mortgage insurance through uh, USDA, the Veterans Administration, and of course, uh, FHA. Um, so how, how can these federal programs uh, better help Utah realize the goal of a safe, decent, and affordable home for every family? And are there any specific improvements that you'd like to see to the programs? Sure. Yeah, these these federal programs are are really important. As I mentioned, we're, you know we're we're trying to stretch our resources as far as we possibly can, and 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 the state piece of this, the local piece, the 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 private and and nonprofit sectors. But 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 we can't uh, you, you know we can't I, I don't think overstate how important the federal piece of this is, um, and uh, especially in financing and and low income and deeply affordable housing. So re reducing the the fifty percent private activity bond requirement for low-income housing tax credit projects to 25 percent, um, I, I think we think would free up funds for more housing developments. That, that's something that we're definitely in favor of. Um, revisiting the formula grant calculations for home investment partnership funds. Uh, in, in the state of Utah, we receive an average of about eight and a half million dollars per year. Uh, and, and these funds are absolutely crucial uh, to offsetting Utah's extreme per unit cost for affordable units. And, and more funds would, would clearly um, help us there. The same is true for the, uh, the housing trust fund allocation. So, so there are lots of different opportunities out there. Um, I should probably also mention my support for some innovation that uh, Senator Mike Lee from the state of Utah has proposed that uh, deals with using underutilized federal land yeah. to allow for development to expand in the, uh, in the right ways. So Senator Lee's uh, housing open underutilized space to ensure shelter act, I, the house act. I, I love the people that come up with these acronyms, but <laughs> it, the, the idea is it provides for local government solution to increasing land availability for residential use for reasonable value to be deployed nationally for um, for specified expenditures. So a, a governmental entity may grant real property owned by the governmental entity for the development of moderate income housing, which is as fine as those with a household income of, uh, of less than 80% of the county median income. And so the, the bill requires a, a minimum of a 30 year deed restriction. And uh, the, the, the key to this legislation is the fact that the, uh, the, the residential development must be for primary residences. So this is a, a really important guardrail that, that is put into place that will prevent investors from purchasing second homes, um, which I, I mentioned has been a problem in our state of Utah. So, so that's something that we're really interested in and, and a potential change that, that could benefit public land states like Utah. Um, thank you, Governor. I have several questions uh, from our virtual audience. And uh, first question is from Emily uh, Means of KUAR. So this is a press question. Um, Utah law prohibits municipalities from enacting rent controls. Uh, Salt Lake City saw the third largest rent increase in the nation over the past three years. What options is the state looking into to help renters? Is rent control on the table? Yeah, so rent control is not on the table. I, I mean, I you know we we've certainly seen rent control uh, tried in 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 different municipal municipalities across the country, and uh, I I would argue um, uh, that uh, that that it has not been effective at all um, anywhere that it's been tried. And so no, it it is not on the table. Again, we believe that that getting more supply is is the most important piece of this. And and Salt Lake City is is one of the municipalities that we're working working most closely mostly with on, uh, on, on deeply affordable and moderate uh, uh, affordable housing in, uh, in, in Salt Lake County and, and Salt Lake City. Um, the mayor has been great to work with there. Um, there are several housing projects and more to come that, uh, that, that are, are, are wonderful projects. And, and we really believe that by, by increasing the, uh, the supply, we'll be able to, uh, to drive down the, uh, the, the price of, of rentals uh, across the Salt Lake Valley. So that's, that's what we're working on. And that's what we're talking about and we're excited to see these new programs put into place well great she, emily also asks i think you've already answered this question but if you want to add anything to it uh, what sorts of local zoning changes would you support uh, to increase the availability of affordable housing i mean you mentioned adu greater density 
Uh, anything else you want to add, Governor, to that? Yeah, the, the, those are the big ones. Um, but but what I will say is we've made several other changes as well. Um, the, we kind of took some baby steps a couple of years ago. We've been adding to this as, uh, as well. But we, we have a requirement now, and it, it's always been there that, that, that every municipality had to have uh, an affordable housing plan. Um, but there was, there was no enforcement. Very few of them actually did. And uh, we've now made that uh, mandatory. And in fact, we've, we've given them a suite of options that they're able to choose from, um, but they have to choose from those, those options on what they're going to do to ensure that there is, there is affordable housing in every single municipality. And we, we've tied that to uh, some of their transportation funding. Uh, to, so, so there is, you know, there's a, both a, a carrot and a stick that, that hasn't existed before when it comes to, uh, to, to those requirements. And uh, to our municipalities' credit, um, they are stepping up in, in very big ways. Um, so, some of them have been, uh, have, have been much more, more, more forceful in, uh, in making zoning changes to, uh, to enhance affordable housing within their communities. But every community is now taking steps that wasn't true even even just three or four years ago. And, uh, and so we're, we're anxious. Again, we're monitoring all of these. Uh, we're, we're measuring the changes that are happening there and the number of affordable units that are coming online in every municipality. And, uh, and they have to report back on those things. And so those, those, are, those are big and important changes. Um, and, and some of them are, you know, some of, some of these are a, a little specific. We had a, a big housing project up in Summit County, which is near Park City, uh, which is one of our least affordable communities for for obvious reason and uh, this is a this was a um, this was a project that had, had been had, they tried to approve several times and had been held up and the uh, the legislature actually did step in in this case and say no we're going to uh, we're going to approve this project and and make this this project happen that's the kind of the most forceful the legislature has been again uh, uh, fairly controversial we'll we'll see how that how that uh, pans out the, the last piece I will say though that, that I think we need to continue to look at is the uh, the, the ability of, uh, of of local communities to uh, to pass a referendum to challenge or override decisions that are made at the local municipality level when it comes to approving these types of, of projects. Um, oftentimes, we'll have a, a project approved, and then uh, with with a, a fairly simple process, um, people are able to you know with the NIMBYism able to get signatures and uh, then get it on the ballot and override that that project we've seen that happen frequently throughout the uh, throughout the state um it's something i'm concerned about again we we uh the, the the whole idea behind our our democratic republic is that we elect officials and then those officials make decisions and if we don't like those decisions then we should you know we should elect someone else but the ability to very easily overturn um, a decision by a local city council um i i think is something we have have to really look at it's, it's a problem nationwide uh it, it's really hard especially for investors who are investing in these types of projects to uh if if, if there's no stability in the system if they they can't be sure that uh, that that once they've gone through the process and done everything right and gotten a decision made and now starting to invest in a project that that can be ripped out from under them very quickly um that that's that's a problem uh, of the system and something that may be a little bit out of balance i think we should have the ability to overturn um, egregious decisions with with broad support from a community to overturn. But when a handful of people in a neighborhood can uh, can can get something on a ballot and, and overturn something fairly easily, we, we may be a little bit out of balance there. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. You're right. It's a, it's a national issue. Um, let me just go a little bit to uh, to to politics. Um, you know, as a reliably red state, we're running out of time here, but Utah has produced many conservative political leaders, but also one with a reputation for working collaboratively across party lines, like the late Senator uh, Orrin Hatch, who I had the opportunity to work with when I worked for, for Bob Dole years ago. Uh, you have similarly spoken about the need to tone down the divisive rhetoric that so often defines our politics and culture and work on a bipartisan basis. Uh, would you like to share, uh, Governor, any lessons learned on how to build a broad-based political support and get things done 
And any guidance uh, for those watching who may be thinking about a career in politics or public service? Well, well Dennis, thank you. And, and thank you for recognizing Utah and, and the unique brand of, of politics that we have tried, um, mostly successfully, but, but we make mistakes too, uh, to have here in Utah. We, we really do believe in, in a collaborative spirit. Um, and uh, uh, sadly, that's not in vogue right now across the country. And, and it's, it is becoming more of a challenge even here in Utah as we, we become more polarized and, and more divided. Um, um, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to set a tone where we're not othering people, uh, where, where everyone feels like they're at the table. Even if we disagree, we can disagree the right way. We can have healthy debate, um, but, but we, we don't have to undermine people or, or call into question the, the, the morals of, of people on the other side uh, of us. Um, I, I, I'm very proud of, of our legislature. Uh, they, they don't always get it right, but, but about 90% of the bills in the state of Utah pass with uh, with with unanimous support or near unanimous support, with a very strong bipartisan effort, and that's you know that's 500 bills every year. And wow. uh, I, but but I, I do want to say I had a very sobering conversation several months ago with the the Swiss ambassador to the United States. He had hosted several governors there at the Swiss embassy, and uh, he spoke to us. I, I was surprised by by his speech. I've spoken often about the toxic divide in our nation and how dangerous it is and how difficult it is for us to accomplish the hard things when. We're, we're this divided and, and we hate each other so much. He, he spoke very movingly of uh, uh, and with gratitude and admiration for the United States and the powerful role that uh, America has played in protecting peace and prosperity for so many decades in Europe and, and across the world. But then he, he gently scolded us for the, uh, the petty partisanship and, and bickering and culture wars that have seemed to overtake in the US culture and politics and worried that uh, that a time when the world needs strong, united uh, US leadership, um, that we were losing that and that void. It's, it's more than just being able to accomplish things like, like lowering the price of housing here in the United States. It really is about what's happening in Russia and China and Ukraine and, and the struggles that are happening uh, and, and that, that, that can happen because of the void created by our fighting over ridiculous things that, that really don't matter as much in the, in the long term. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that anyone out there listening uh, can, can join uh, th this cause of, of finding common ground, finding ways to work together, turning off cable news, uh, to, to, you know, saying positive things on social media uh, instead of tearing others down. Uh, it, 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 we need more people like that in politics desperately. And uh, I, I have a feeling that I'm preaching to the choir with most of the people listening to this and certainly appreciate your leadership, Dennis, in this area. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. I mean, that's the the, the premise of the bipartisan policy center where you can be a partisan, a very committed uh, partisan, but also uh, seek to find common ground uh, with others who may disagree with you. And you actually, if you work out a little bit, you'll be surprised you might find common ground and, and advance, advance an issue. But this has been a tremendous conversation, Governor. It's really refreshing to hear someone like yourself who's so invigorated and knowledgeable about the, the housing issue. And we really appreciate the efforts and the leadership you're showing, uh, not just in Utah, but uh, in the United States. So thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, before we sign off, I'd like to encourage our audience uh, to mark your calendars for June 23rd, when the Terwilliger Center will be hosting a one-day in-person summit on housing supply at the Hamilton Hotel in Washington, DC. The event will focus on identifying meaningful bipartisan solutions to our nation's housing shortage and affordability crisis. And I encourage you all to visit the Terwilliger Center's webpage available through bipartisanpolicy.org for more information on this event. Uh, thanks again, everyone uh, who tuned in. And from all of us at BPC, we wish you good help good health and hope to see you soon uh, in the coming month. Thank you very much.